Hi, everybody. Welcome to this event. I'll just get myself organised. Um, I'm Anna Fowley from SCBO, and I'm going to be chairing this event today about modernising governance. Um, we decided to, to have this debate because um, we're having an internal debate, and I know there's a debate in the sector about the fact we've got governance that probably I learned on Monday st comes from 1601 when the regulation of charities happened in Scotland. If you haven't heard Shirley Otto's research on this, it's fascinating. Um, so I, is that still the way we should be doing things now? Do things need to change? Um, so we brought together some uh, speakers for you who've all got very different perspectives on the world of governance. And I'm going to introduce them now. Then we're going to have uh, a couple of uh, inputs and the panel uh, will respond and um, then we'll have, have a discussion. If there's an opportunity, we'll uh, take questions from the floor. But we'll, we'll just see how the timing goes. So we're kind of um, winging it slightly, but, uh, uh, but also the main thing I think for us today is to hear from what our speakers uh, d have experienced because they've all come from very diverse, um, diverse backgrounds and experiences. So I'll just introduce them just now. Um, Gillian, who on the, so when I say, because I can only see, it's, it's like a Queen video, yeah, Gillian at this end, um, provides corporate and charity law advice to the third sector, um, she works for Anderson Strathairn, um, she's advised on the structure and governance model um, underlying countless Scottish charities, uh, and she's also, uh, she also advises on areas of dispute in respect of governance, we know there's quite a lot of that around, and has conducted governance reviews for a, a number of large charities. She's also a trustee herself, so she knows how that feels, and a member of the Law Society um, Scotland Charity Law Subcommittee. Uh, we've got two Fionas. Uh, Fiona McLeod is the, uh, in her, what she describes as her dream job as the chair of the SSPCA, that's the Scottish Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. She's a past chair of the Women's Fund for Scotland, and. Um, has sat on the, uh, the board of a Women's World Banking Organisation um, and on the development board of Pancreatic Cancer UK. Uh, she's also got a lot of commercial experience on boards, uh, including Denim Energy Services, Clydesdale Bank and Virgin Money, and she conducts reviews on board effectiveness. Our other Fiona is Fiona uh, Matovu, who is the co-founder of award-winning social enterprise uh, Radiant and Brighter. Uh, she's been a leading voice, I'm sure if you, if you haven't met Fiona before, you will have heard of her. She's a leading voice in ethnic diversity and inclusion in Scotland, and she's an anti-racism researcher and works with organisations to reflect and review their systems, structures and policies. And Megan, Megan's my pal from uh, Who Cares Scotland days. She is currently a policy and public affairs officer at Who Cares Scotland, which is an advocacy organisation for care experienced people. Um, Megan was the vice chair of Who Cares Scotland when she was just 17, and I was on their board at that time. She stepped down as vice chair last year because she's working for them now. Um, but she's been part of the independent review of inspection, scrutiny and regulation, and she works with young people to help them share their views and feel empowered in the policy and decision-making <laughs> places. And we have Kenneth Pinkerton, who um, is from Brodie's. He's a former trustee of SCVO, so again, a good pal. Uh, Kenneth specialises in charity law and governance. He's uh, worked with philanthropists, uh, royal charter organisations, big umbrella and membership bodies, us, family, foundations, culture bodies, sports organisations, and he's worked on some very high profile governance cases too, involving Oscar. And he's also a member of the Charity Law Association. So what I'm going to uh, ask you to do is to start off with Kenneth and Gillian, um, to are going to set the scene with a bit of discussion around the legal position, but also talk about things that they've found from their experience in dealing with governance. What makes it work and what is maybe needing a bit of improvement. Um, so I'll start off with uh, Gillian. Is that, is that yep. okay? Is that the order you agreed yes. <laughs> um, If you want to. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to start with a bit of a disclaimer because I'm a lawyer and that's what we do. And my disclaimer is that I find it quite hard to actually be impartial when I'm talking about the subject of governance. And the reason for that is, I think as a charities and governance solicitor, 
you're a wee bit like a nurse or a doctor in an A&E department. You have seen all the absolute horror shows, all the no, genuinely the worst case scenarios where people are coming to you and spending money on your services rather than in furthering their objects where they've got themselves into a, a terrible situation. So that does, I'm saying at the outset, colour some of my judgment on this. So you'll have a charity come to you, or a, a non-charity, a third sector volunteer organisation come to you with the most laudable of objects. And on paper, the constitution looks perfectly respectable. Their governance model, again, on paper, looks respectable. But when it's put into practice, that's where you can find things getting into to difficulties. And th the legal drafting can actually only get you so far. And I think in Scotland, our third sector is glorious. It's very buoyant. There are loads of really passionate people. But with that passion can sometimes come a really strong emotional connection to what you're doing, which can be both a positive and a negative. And the traditional model of governance, which you see most often, I would say, in the third sector, is these large membership models where you've got potentially huge numbers of members. So anyone resident in Leith can be a member or anyone who supports the objects and activities of the organisation can be a member. And then from that huge body, you have democratic elections onto the board. So depending on the type of organisation you're with, you could have service users um, or family members of service users elected to the board. Sometimes you find very vulnerable people being elected and they're not necessarily at the best stage in their journey. I know it sounds rich coming from me saying that, but they're not necessarily at the best stage in their journey to be on the board. And also in these democratic models, you can find yourselves with um, certain factions, with ulterior motives coming onto boards. So for me as a lawyer, the starting point has to be, well, what does the law say in all this? What does it say about what is the best and the most appropriate governance model? And uh, sadly, it says very little, <laughs> I would say. And the law is probably quite far behind what we in society would now think of as representing best practice in terms of the makeup of boards, the diversity of boards. The law is quite clear that there are restrictions on who can be on a board, you know, if you've committed fraud, if you're an undischarged bankrupt. Um, but it says very little about what would make up an ideal board. Yeah, you should be above the, lead, the, the age of legal capacity. There shouldn't be discrimination in terms of the Equality Act. But beyond that, you've got huge flexibility in terms of who makes up your board. And I said earlier, we see so many organisations still in the third sector that have this membership model. So you might have a board of 12 and eight places are for people elected from the membership. And then you might have four for co-opted directors. So co-opted are, are people who are appointed by the board themselves based on their skills and expertise. But what tends to happen, and I'm not sure if this is Kenneth's experience as well, is that you'll see organisations doing, doing the appropriate bit in terms of the co-opted, coming up with a skills matrix, doing open recruitment, doing interviews. That's how I myself have been appointed to boards but you don't get that for the elected. And quite often senior management teams and boards feel that they're just kind of stuck with whoever it is that pitches up at the AGM as a member, puts their hand up and then gets appointed onto the board. But what we're seeing now from regulators is this real push to have that skills matrix, to have people with the appropriate expertise on boards. And that's absolutely as it should be. I, I sometimes have sleepless nights because, again, like a doctor, I probably know too much. I know exactly what our duties are. And more and more is expected of those on boards. And you're generally speaking doing it without any remuneration. So that, that is correct. We're also seeing umbrella bodies and think tanks pushing for more diverse boards, which, again, is as it should be. But I think we have to be realistic and sometimes that isn't really catered for in the way that constitutions are set up. So what I've seen in recent years is 
some charities who've had their fingers burned in these absolute omni shambles of governance situations where they've had people appointed onto boards who maybe don't have the, the requisite capacity. They have these democratic models and they've done a complete about turn and tried to restructure so that they're a sort of single teen entity. So they're not, the board and the members are one and the same. They're not accountable to a larger body of members. That allows the board to kind of hand pick people and ensure that they've got the appropriate skills. It allows more scope for, we, for what we would consider as being diversity. And it's legally perfectly viable. But for me personally, that's not really a route that I would want to see us going down. I don't want to see us getting rid of the service user voice, the membership voice, but I think we need to be more sophisticated about how we do it. I think we need to build in processes and provisions in our constitutions that are saying, okay, people need to be shadowing board members. Candidate needs to be candidates need to be doing training and fully understanding what is involved in being a board member, which is not necessarily having your own manifesto and wanting to affect change. Some of it is actually quite dry, but there are considerable legal responsibilities around this. Having an interview process so that there is a filtering of candidates before the AGM. Now, this sort of thing can be accused of being very anti-democratic in certain bodies, but for me, I want to avoid a situation where people are paying me to sort out hideous problems and instead are paying me to help them with positive steps that they're trying to take and positive projects that they're trying to take. So that is my view on where we currently are. Thank you, Gillian. Arguing against democracy there. I love to hear that. <laughs> we, I'd say from an SCBO's perspective, we have uh, 11 trustees and six of them are elected from the membership. And so far, not been an omni shambles. But you never know, because we don't know, as you say, until the AGM who's going who's to come through. So, uh, Kenneth, what's your perspective? Thanks, Anna. Um, on the election point, I personally don't think there's anything wrong <coughs> with going to the members and saying we have a regulatory, not requirement, but regulator says that we should have the right mix of skills and this is actually what's missing and we would really like this person or a person with these skills to stand um, to try and get away from this. At an election you get what you get. So as I say, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying this is what we want and I would suggest that that's what the, the board should be doing and telling the members this is what we what we need to fulfill um, the expectations i suppose what i was thinking of moving on to was the diversity piece because i do think that there is a challenge between what is now i would say accepted as the best model on the board anyway that you should have the right mix of skills that reflects what your charity does. And that goes way back to the first Oscar report, one plus one parent families, I think around about 2007, 2008. Um, and that's where we're going to. Um, and how that fits in with having a diverse board. And on the diversity point, just to be a dull lawyer um, and put out some facts and figures there, um, this is from a report, um, Charities Inclusive Governance Report 2022, and it was the top 500 UK charities. So there will be some cross-border ones there um, operating in Scotland as well. So only 13% of charity boards have gender parity. 29% of charities have all white boards compared to 4% of FTSE 100 boards. 51% of charities do not have a single minority ethnic woman on their board. Over one in 10 charities have an all male senior leadership team. Large charities are seven times more likely to have an all white board than FTSE 100 companies, which suggests to me that as a sector, we're lagging behind um, the commercial sector, for want of a better word. And on diversity, another we definition, um, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, which I had never heard of, I thought we might have got Oxford English, but however, <laughs> defines diversity as the condition of having or being composed of many elements. 
And at the end it's of this definition, it says, remember that people are often a mixture of different characteristics and life experience. So try not to assume what a person's primary characteristic might be. <coughs> and that struck a chord with me because possibly you are all sitting there thinking, there's Kenneth, partner at Brodie's, white, male, pale, and stale. Which is, and that's the sort of, we want to move away from that, boards, this idea, the crusty old men at the top, tapping the shoulders, that's what we're trying to re-energise the sector to get away from that. However, I sit before you as a married gay man who was born in Cumbernauld and in 1979 at the Labour election with Jim Callaghan, my family were the family who was pictured and was in the Labour Party's paper, newspaper that went round during the election saying, this is the family that we are looking to for the future. So I would argue that I am not in that category of people. However, I, I have come across an instance where um, we were picking a selection board and it was, you know, Kenneth, you're not diverse enough. <laughs> so I think there is a very good point there on you know, scratching the surface about people, not looking at them and taking them at face value because somebody can be more diverse, diverse of thought than you actually think. And I have railed against the great and the good and I have recently sat in trustee meetings of charity boards um, when they have been giving out grants and there was um, one particular philanthropy charity and it was, you know, um, the grave of the philanthropist needs to be, you know, tidied up and it, it would be really good if we did that. And there was a sort of wave of, yeah, that's really good, that's really good. Now, the man died, I think, in the late 1890s. And I was sitting there before we even got to whether or not it was within the charitable purposes, I was sitting there thinking, it's a cost of living crisis. What, what are you thinking about? You know, where, where is this idea? But I think that was, a, if there had been diversity of thought on the board, I was only the advisor, then there would have been a wave of people, hopefully, who would have come in and said, <coughs> hold your horses. Um, but I do think that in the diversity and inclusion piece, and I think inclusion is indifferent from diversity, we have to be careful <coughs> not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are a lot of very experienced people who are retired, who are white, male, pale and stale, who can give our sector an awful lot and have an awful lot of experience. So I suppose where I'm coming from is we want to capture the good. OK, get rid of the dross. We always like a clear out. But we really want to capture that good because one of the challenges, I think, on the diversity piece is supporting the trustees who are coming in, who we want in our sector to give us that diversity and revitalise the sector, but they need support when it comes to training, when it comes to understanding what their legal obligations are, and there's a lot to be learned. So I would just like to see that we don't actually go so far on diversity and inclusion that we get rid of a valuable part of the sector. Thank you, Kenneth. And I, I totally agree with you on that diversity of thought. It's something, um, and the next, nurturing the next generation, that whole succession planning and making sure more people um, are thinking about becoming trustees um, in charities and, and other voluntary organisations. So, yeah, thank you very much for that perspective. I'm going to ask for some reflections from our panel members now and what you've heard from Gillian and Kenneth um, and some thoughts um, yourselves. So I'm going to start with Fiona with an F um, to to talk, again, to respond to what you've heard and to think about that, uh, from your perspective, that more commercial approach um, that might be helpful in a charity session and anything else that comes to your mind. Super, thank you. And I would never describe you as stale, Kenneth, by a, by a very long <laughs> shot. Uh, so I would say that I have, in my commercial career and in my charity career, worked with some incredibly diverse groups of people. I think 
One of the teams I led in my um, executive career had 23 different nationalities, and it was probably one of the best jobs I ever had. I have to be honest, it was also one of the most difficult because trying to corral that breadth and diversity of background and actually make decisions was incredibly challenging. But, you know, I've seen the joy of it, but I've also seen some of the, the challenges with it. I'd probably start by saying the Scottish SPCA, you know, 184-year charity, I certainly came in thinking it would definitely be majority male, probably in their 50s in terms of the people that, that work with us or volunteer with us. But actually, we're 78% female, and the average age is 35. So, you know, quite a different look to the, to the charity itself. Kirsten Campbell's in the audience today, our, our wonderful CEO, and her executive team is 80% uh, female. Um, and my board is 50% male-female. Though I have to say, although I wanted gender diversity, I actually wanted diversity in its broadest sense when I was putting the board together. Uh, and to me, it's about diversity of experience, diversity of personality, diversity of age, it's everything. It's that richness that people bring to the party. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about induction because I'm very passionate about that as well, about bringing out what people are holistically, not just what's on their CV, which I think chimes with what, what both Kenneth and Gillian have said. So I remember one of the things, I, I do quite a lot of work in Australia, and when I'm over there, I always take the opportunity to run training courses for CEOs and chairs of charities just on a pro bono basis. And I remember doing one of those and this man got very heated with me and said, wait a minute, just stop. Why are you talking about KPIs and governance? We're a charity for goodness sake, we're not a business. And I said, what I always say in those situations, which is to me, a donor's money is just as important as somebody who's investing for commercial reasons. And some might argue even more so because if, for the SSPCA, if somebody's giving us money in their will, if they're giving it from their pension or from their hard-end wages, I want to make sure that I have that governed really well by my board. So really building on the points that were there. To me, I, I absolutely agree we need to simplify governance and make sure that decisions are made and make sure that boards are diverse. I feel we have a moral as well as a commercial obligation to make sure that the people who give us their money, that that money is wisely spent and that it's well governed by the board. So that's the donor side. In terms of those we serve, so the people that we look after, and in our case, the animals that we look after who can't actually speak up for themselves, then I believe that there's a really important role for governance there as well in terms of they can't say where they want that money to be spent. They can't say whether we should lobby for this change in the law or what we should do to protect them. And likewise, the very vulnerable people that we often have to deal with, whether it's a farmer or whether it's somebody with a pet, there's lots of issues around domestic abuse being linked with animal abuse. All the people that we have to work with, they rely on a really strong board making good, well-reasoned decisions. So to me, both the people we serve and the people that fund us, if you like, deserve to have really good governance. So definitely simplify it, but I would agree with Kenneth, don't throw the baby out, out with the bathwater. Another thing I would say, and it's maybe a bit controversial, I want people to have absolute joy in everything they do in life. You know, that's just one of my mantras. If you don't enjoy it, find something else to do. And the word joy is something I kind of carry around with me. Um, and I want people to have joy from being on charity boards. But I absolutely don't want anybody to think that they're an easy ride and that you can just turn up, pad your CV by saying, I'm on the board of this, and you know, that'll help you get a proper board afterwards. Anybody who sits on a board that I chair knows that I hold them to exactly the same standards of performance, of bringing their whole self to the party. If you've got a view, I want to hear it. If you've got a background that we don't even know about, I want to hear it. No, I really want quality, high caliber people on the board. So this notion that somehow a charity is a bit of a ticket to ride till you get a proper board to me isn't, doesn't chime. So that's something I feel strongly about. Um, and the way I would describe it is probably simply for the Scottish SPCA, I always think that the back office, you almost run like a business, probably a family business, because it's very much a family culture. So you're really looking at it with good governance. How are you spending your money? Are you keeping legal? Are you doing all the right things? And then the front office, which Kirstine and her amazing team run, turns out with you no know, deep care, love, support for all the people that we serve. And to me, those two things aren't in conflict. In fact, they're necessary. You actually need good governance and you know, absolute focus on your pa and passion on your purpose. So that's what I would say. I think it really chimes with, with what, what both Julian and Kenneth have said. 
And then you, you both also talked about this notion of what I would call induction or inclusion. We talk a lot about diversity. I think sometimes we don't talk enough about inclusion. So from an, 35 years in business, which I know you can't believe because I look like I'm 22, even in this bright, unflattering light, uh, I've got really, really, really frustrated with people that claim victory when they say they have appointed somebody to a board. Oh, aren't we clever? We've appointed this young, ethnically diverse person to our board. Look, job done, that's it. That is the start of the journey. You only get to claim success when that person has been in place for a year or, or, or 18 months, is finding great enjoyment from it, is able to contribute, and has felt welcomed to that group. So to me, induction is absolutely <coughs> crucial, and it's something I'm personally really, really passionate about. Um, and people need to be included and feel included in order to perform. I'm seeing quite a few nods around the room, and, and I think that's true. You do need to feel included, and I've certainly been on boards where you turn up and nobody really tells you anything. You kind of wing it. You sit there, you wonder what they're all talking about. So, uh, it, as Kirsty knows with the Scottish SPCA board, I actually personally went in and made some amendments to that when I joined. And maybe I'll just share briefly kind of four things that I think are good practice on inclusion or induction. Number one is get really clear with somebody when they join your board and what this, why, the what, if you like, the what of your organization. So what are its short-term plans? What's, what's its strategy? Why does it exist? What's its business model? You know, for us, it's preventing harm to animals in the first place. I want to make sure that somebody really gets that and that they're really passionate about that and they understand that context. And then they're more likely to be successful and they can ask you questions. So taking the time to do that. So that's the what. The second part to me is the how. And I think this is what a lot of boards, not just charity boards, miss. And that's about looking beyond the CV and really listening to that person. So, so often, I remember being in a board meeting with Virgin Money, and they said, oh, well, they were making a decision, we just bought, Clydesdale Bank had bought, and they said, well, nobody here's got any brand experience, so we need to do whatever. And I was like, excuse me, you know, I've run this brand, and I've done that, and they're like, oh, we didn't know that, because nobody took the time to ask. So please, if you're chairing a board, or even if you're with colleagues on a board, ask them about themselves way beyond their CV, and then include all of those skills and those personality traits and those insights that they bring to your board. So that's very much the how. And I always talk about a triangle of space, challenge, and support. So I give actual coaching to people that join my board on make sure you're balancing those three, and I'll give them feedback after board meetings if there's been too much challenge and not enough support or whatever. So help people be successful. Third piece is the culture, um, and that's really important. It's what's it like being the recipient of our services? What's it like working in this organization? And we're gonna hear, it, I think, a bit more shortly around what the lived experience is of being in a charity and, and actually experiencing that. But for me, every trustee in the SSPCA goes out and rides with an animal rescue officer. So they actually get into the homes of people in Scotland and see the challenges they're facing and their animals are facing. Likewise, they visit our rescue centres. Because unless you get under the bonnet, as I would call it, and really understand it, you're never going to really have the passion and bring great insight to your board because you only understand what you're hearing in the boardroom table. You need to really understand what's going on out there in the street. And then my final thing um, would be continuous learning. You know, young people can get stale as well and set in their ways, so I agree with Kenneth. It's not just about, you know, this person's old. Some of my freest thinkers are, are older people on the board, but I equally have a lot of really young insight that I'm bringing. So there would be my calls to action. It would be keep that commercial edge, because frankly, the people that support us deserve it, and make sure you really include and induct people and make them successful when they join your board. That's the measure of success, not whether they've joined and you've got a number that you can tick. So that, that's what I was going to say, Anna. Thank, Thank you very much, Fiona. And that, is, is, uh, that emphasis on induction is, is interesting, and I agree with that, and I think it is part of the inclusion um, agenda too. But one of the things we found in doing work on the Third Sector Governance Code was the, the absolute lack of induction. It's one of the things that doesn't happen particularly across the sector. There is some, and we do it ourselves, but they, there's... That's the one thing that is, that is severely lacking and we would like to encourage more people to, to, to do. So I'm now going to move on to, to Megan, who comes from very much from that lived experience perspective and was, was very young when she joined the Board of Who Cares and um, was none, nonetheless 
effective for those things. In fact, more effective because didn't have to ride with the animal rescue people, people because she had been that person um, and brought that experience herself. So she's, um, she was young, she was care experienced, is care experienced, and is from Inverness like me. So that we've got Highlander, anti Highlander bias as well in there, haven't we? <laughs> Megan, give us your perspective. Thanks, Anna. Um, yeah, I think joining a board at 17 is definitely not um, kind of what I expected to be doing that year. Um, and I'm not going to kind of say that I, I fully understood what I was getting into um, when that happened. Um, but I was living in care. Um, Who Cares Scotland's mission was um, to kind of uphold rights for people in care, um, to make policy change um, for, for what was actually happening. Um, and I think if the overarching purpose of a board is to set the strategic direction um, for the organisation um, and you don't have people that are directly involved in that social issue at that level, then you're not, you're not going to fulfil your mission. Um, a charity should want to become obsolete and if you don't actually have people that are um, kind of dealing with these issues day in, day out um, and the people around them are, um, you're, you're not really being genuine. Um, and I don't, I take Kenneth's point about um, you might have somebody that is, what did you say, old, pale and stale? But I think for, for every um, kind of per person of that description who might be useful to you because they're an accountant or they're a HR professional, you will also be able to find um, maybe a young person with a disability um, or a black woman or whatever characteristics you're looking for um, that is also an accountant. Um, I don't think that um, making a diverse board has to be that there are less seats at the table for someone um, who's kind of already been there or who maybe fits a more traditional description. Um, you, you can increase your board. Um, our board had up to 15 seats um, in our constitution. Uh, five of those had to be care experienced people, um, but we also had other people who are maybe foster carers um, and you know, strategic directors of public bodies um, or social workers. Um, and by increasing your board, you're increasing the knowledge and the skills that your organisation benefits from. It doesn't have to be an either or. This shouldn't be a deficit. Oh, well, if we do that, we might, you know, throw something away that we, we really value. Um, you can include it. You can grow from it. Um, and in terms of, like, as, as you said at the start, Gillian, like, this is a, a legal obligation to, to have good governance. Um, a 17-year-old does not necessarily automatically know how to read a balance paper, but if you have board members sitting beside you, like Anna Fowley, who can go, this is what that means, mm. and I can say, that doesn't look right to me, and she goes, ask them then. That is how you learn. Um, we had people like SCVO come in to do external training. Um, we had mentoring. Um, what was really important to me as uh, the deputy chair was that I made sure that people, especially newer board members, had the space and the time um, to kind of organize their thoughts um, and not feel like they were holding people up by asking a question and um, they had to have the confidence to be able to do that um, and actually I think maybe not having everyone you know uh, having decades of experience um, with financial management can actually maybe lead to better governance because I would look at a number and go sorry but that doesn't make sense to me like I've added up these numbers and that should be that and it would it would pick up things that other people have looked over so it's not necessarily always a bad thing. Um, I think there is definitely a danger of tokenization with lived experience. Um, I completely take what you said, Gillian, that people have to be at the right point in their lives for it. Um, and that is something that is, is really, really important if you're gonna um, start to look at people who are maybe in a difficult situation in their life that you do it safely. Um, but there will be people that are right for it and there'll be people that are not. Um, and part of what you can do um, to make your board more inclusive um, is do things like so our employees have benefits like access to counselling and access to health benefits that applies to our board as well um, there are things like um, considering the impact of poverty um, so for me living in care I definitely I didn't have a device to do online meetings um, I was living in food poverty at a time I was homeless I didn't have money to travel to meetings but making sure that I had all those things um, in advance so that I could attend meetings, making sure that there was food at meetings so that I could eat. Um, all of those things are like things that you need to do to look after your board as well as you would look after your staff. Um, I think, yeah, totally take what you said about the election process and the 
the opportunity for anyone to kind of put themselves forward and you to get into a tricky situation with that. Um, but for us, what we would do is we had an a, a, was a three stage application process first. So they had to apply, they had to do a written statement, they had to do an interview with us, then they had to do an interview with our young people. Um, and then those who had kind of passed all of those stages would then be put forward for election at the AGM where they could still be rejected. Um, but it made sure that you were kind of putting in some safeguards around that. Um, yeah, I don't want to talk too much, but I think basically if you say that you're up for equality and diversity and you think it is important, but not if it inconveniences you directly, um, you're not really being an ally, you're paying lip service. Um, there's definitely things that you can do to work around it. Um, and I'd encourage people to do that because the status quo of kind of old pale white men running things doesn't always get us into great places either. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> And I have to say that uh, I will never forget Megan standing up at a Who Cares Scotland AGM and explaining the annual accounts to a bunch of you know, very diverse people of all shapes and sizes, including babies, in the room, where she explained exactly what it meant in words that everybody could understand, not a spreadsheet in sight, and it just it was so powerful. And having seen you when you first came on, go. What's the point of a spreadsheet? What's that? It was so. It was just so inspiring. And just to, to emphasize that the sort of mentoring point is that very, very often people like us will say, and of course we'll offer support to those people that are coming from a, a, you know, a different background onto the board who are not maybe an accountant or an HR professional or whatever, we'll offer them support. Actually, we had mutual mentoring and we were um, that, maybe in that category of old, white, and from a professional, but maybe middle-aged rather than old, but you know, from, from that category, the support that we got from Megan and other care experienced young people on the board to understand the reality of what it was we were trying to address and just to learn about, um, about their, all their experiences, that was just as, if not more, beneficial to us as board members. So it's not a one-way learning process, it's a two-way learning process, and I think that's that's really important. Anyway, I'll get off my soapbox now. It's still in my heart, Megan. Um, and introduce Fiona with a P, who's going to, um, again, give her response to what she's heard so far and, um, and bring that kind of uh, experience of having founded a charity, which obviously you saw a gap there in terms of ethnic diversity and all the work you've done there. Um, so give us your perspective, Fiona. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for... Uh, such a rich conversation. Um, when we founded Radiant and Brighter with Michael, my husband, he's in the audience somewhere. We founded Radiant and Brighter in uh, 2012 and became a community interest company in 2014. Now, at the, at the onset, we'd been part, uh, we'd, uh, we'd been in a situation where we're not allowed to work or claim benefits or anything for a period of five years. And for those five years, we had to depend on family and friends. After that experience, it informed a lot of what we understood uh, to be the way in which we, um, the way in which we respond to who we, who we consider to be the other. And uh, five years on, we set up Radiant and Brighter. When we set up Radiant and Brighter, we thought there were so many things that made it difficult for us to set up as a charity. So we actually started thinking as a partnership because my husband had been an entrepreneur back home. I come from a very entrepreneur family that's, that's like that. But we wanted to do something that changed lives and worked for people that had experiences like ours. And we thought the charity model had so many barriers in its way. And this is the thing to understand. The, the element around structural barriers is where for us it started. We needed to think what is gonna work for us. So when you're setting up a charity, you need trustees. We did not know enough people that understood the system enough that could be part, on, that could be on our board. And the ones we knew did not understand what we were trying to set up because they didn't have the lived experience of what we were trying to do. And lived experience, everyone has lived experience, but what we wanted was somebody who understood the structural inequalities, the challenges, the difficulties of being black, a migrant within the country. We didn't have that. 
uh, as if that wasn't enough, uh, we weren't well connected, so we didn't have the social capital to be able to engage with people that would buy into our purpose and our narrative, because our narrative was it is important to have people uh, like us, we have value that we bring, and the narrative was we don't want you here. So it was difficult to find people like that as well. So we were cautious as well of being further dis stigmatized because when people see, um, and this has happened over a long period of time, where the narrative has been, um, has been that people who come from Africa are poor, they need to be helped. We didn't want to affirm that narrative that we need to be helped. Absolutely, we can't help ourselves, but we wanted to work. In fact, uh, very early on, I remember getting so tired of people asking, how can we help you? And it wasn't that we didn't want the help. It's the way in which it was said that was derogatory and often very in intimidating, kind of saying, oh, I know you need help. And we still have that. We go somewhere, we're talking about uh, diversity and inclusion, and suddenly it turns on, let's help you. Organizations that are looking for diversity and inclusion, they want to be helped to become more diverse. When you walk in, you're told, how can we help, you know, we want to help your people. I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> you don't want to help my people. I have people like me that I engage with. You want to engage with those people, let's think about it. So we didn't want to be stigmatized further. But we also face trust issues because for a charity, and, and this happens a lot in Scotland, for an organization that's set up by black people, being able to be trusted, we went to an organization, that, um, a, a funding body, and they said to us, you're too small. And I'm thinking, you, you, you're supposed to be supporting equality, well, how are we too small? But because of the color element and because of what we've known across the world, uh, the racism and, and the, the narrative around being black, people do not trust us and they didn't trust us. They do now, but they didn't and some still don't maybe, but at the time they didn't. So we had so many barriers in, our, in, our, in what we were trying to do. So we decided we'd set up a community interest company and also we wanted to drive the vision. And it felt like if we set up as a community interest company, we were able to both be on the board and drive the vision and also be uh, uh, within the organization that we were setting up. But responding to you know, the conversation so far, um, maybe a few things that I'd like to say. First and, fo first and foremost, um, the way in which we understand and the way we run governance has got to change. And why it needs to change, it is not white male pale versus lived experience. It's let's bring the experiences, the expertise that we need on the table. If you are not representative of the people that you are serving, I ask, do you have the expertise you need on the table? Do you actually have the, what you need to be able to run that organization? Because in the, in the country that we are, often there is an element of, not an element, it, it's always about, um, about being able to have uh, a democratic vote, right? Now, I think, like you were saying, Kenneth, if, if the people that you're representing are not on the table and you're choosing to look at, <laughs> to look at something that doesn't meet their needs, Who's gonna have that vote that says to you that you need to do something different? And even if you had the democratic vote, often the people that are, ser that are being served are underrepresented on the board as well. So they'll bring one person, two people, and so they have the alternative uh, discussion, but they are kind of isolated that discussion is not going to take off if they are not well represented. I'll say a couple of things and then I'll stop there for now. So one of the things that I think we need to think about in terms of boards, I'll tell you a story. Um, in America, um, black people were not allowed to vote. And after a while, they decided that they could vote. But when they decided they could vote, some states decided they didn't want them to vote. So what they did, um, apart from the fact that 
only about 60 years ago they were voting as three quarters of a person, black people. Then some states decided what we are going to do, we're going to put certain things in place. So if you're gonna vote, they had voting tax, you had to pay for two years before the voting started. And those two years meant that black people who had not been allowed to work, who were not able to acquire that level of wealth, could not pay and therefore they could not vote. The second thing, when that didn't work, they then said, actually, if your grandfather voted, then you can vote. But of course your grandfather didn't vote because you were black, you had never been allowed to vote. And then they said, oh no, actually, what we'll do is we'll get you to read some texts uh, before the voting. So when you get to voting, they get, they get a white person, they get you to read a constitutional text, and if you read that well and explain it well, we'll get you to vote. But of course black people were not even allowed to go to education in America. And so they got them the most complex texts, and then they got the white people the simplest texts. So they could still get through, but the black people couldn't get through. Do you kind of recognize that? If you're gonna be on a governance board, you need to have a certain level of education, you need to have a certain level of finance, you need to be representative of certain things. Do you recognize that? So for me, what we need to be thinking about is where we are going for the future. <coughs> One of the things we need to think about is taking an anti-racism approach. That means that we undo and we challenge what has happened. And before anybody thinks that anti-racism is a political term, it is not. We know that racism has been the way in which we've done, uh, we've done things in our world. What we now need to do is think like Newton's first law of motion, if we don't meet it with an opposing force, anti-racism, it will continue in motion. So we need to change that. And finally, I want to say that um, if you were, if you have a board that does not represent the people that you serve, are you actually doing what you say you were supposed to be doing? Because often the organizations, the charities are founded or to address inequalities and structural challenges. But the issue remains that if you don't represent the people that you serve, then it is highly likely that the very inequalities that you want to challenge are the very inequalities that you are perpetuating. Thank you very much, Fiona. That's, that was really powerful. I think that, that sort of the legacy, which is it's not even a legacy, it still exists from hundreds of years ago, of that kind of benevolent paternalism where, you know, it's the kind of people looking after the poor people that still kind of pervades attitudes, particularly on boards, I think is something we absolutely have to get vexed about and, and change. And also really interested in the, it sounds a bit geeky, but the, the legal structures thing, that, that you went down the kick route rather than a, a traditional charity route, so interested in that. So I want to give our initial two speakers a uh, right of reply to all of that. Um, so I'll start with, uh, with Gillian again, why not? What, what do you make of what you've heard, Gillian? I think mm. I was interested in what Fiona <coughs> McLeod was saying about how the chief exec and the staff team interact with the board. A lot of what we've been talking about today, because it was our mission, was looking at board level and the structure at board level. And Megan and the other Fiona have spoken very eloquently on that. I think what was described by Fiona McLeod is not necessarily what all of us would recognise. That's obviously a model of best practice. A lot of chief execs and senior management teams probably see the board as a necessary evil. They rock up once a quarter. They're not immersed in what the organisation does. And when trustees change, again, there's a kind of, oh God, this is who we've got now. This is going to be a disruptor for the sake of disruption and things like that. So I think a topic for another day is a lot about that interaction mm -hmm. and my absolute pet hate when I have sat at board meetings is when I hear board members use the term you when they address the chair and when they address the members of the senior management team present. Like, there is no you and us. We are the board or you are the board. 
you are part of one organization. So I think sometimes there can still be that us and them dynamic, which is something else um, to be worked through. And yeah, just to to pick up on some of what Megan was saying, I've seen the, the model that Who Cares uses. And I would say, again, that to me represents best practice in how you ensure that you are still getting people with lived experience, the user voice on the board, but that you are filtering sounds horrible but that you are ensuring that that you're not putting a burden on people coming onto the board who maybe aren't ready for that you're making sure that people are fully informed and fully supported when they they come onto the board there are lots of things that are being done in society right now to try and make things better and level the playing field my husband is even more white, male, pale and stale than you, can ask it. <laughs> he's not really taken any diversity boxes, but I know that he's involved in recruitment in the law firm that he is in. And a lot of what is now done in terms of recruitment is looking at levelling the playing field and people getting flags for certain boxes that they tick. This didn't happen in my day. I certainly don't feel sorry for myself, <coughs> but if... My husband and I had both been applying for traineeships, for example, at the same point in time. He's from Bears Den. He wouldn't have got any brownie points. I am from, not very far from Kenneth, I'm from Airdrie originally. So I would have been given brownie points and would have been a leg up. But that does not recognise that I come from a family of, you know, two parents who are teachers, a very, very supportive environment. And I would absolutely hate someone to have given me a leg up because of that. And I also don't want a leg up because... I am female, so I think there is still a lot. We need to get the different voices around the table. We need to level the playing field at a kind of earlier stage. But ultimately, it comes down to having the correct skills and the correct expertise combined with that um, that lived experience. I, I wouldn't want, as Megan was saying, you can bring extra places onto the board, although there can be difficulties around that when you end up with massive, unwieldy boards. And the final point I would make is... Fiona is obviously a chair who brings people out. Uh, Fiona McLeod and is saying, right, what are you bringing to the table? We've all been there at board meetings where there are passengers and we're talking about, well, this is what you need to do when someone joins your board. Yes, to a certain extent, but I also do think there is individual responsibility in making sure that once you understand and if your organisation has made it clear to you what is involved, that you then take responsibility and that you step up and give everything that you can but with all those additional features, like where you are experiencing food poverty, where there are other things that would make it difficult for you to fulfil the role, that those are all in place. Thank you, Gillian. Kenneth? I think what came through for me loud and clear is the, the support and the induction and the continuing learning and refreshing of what we know, and that will hopefully assist when it comes to the inclusion and the diversity because again to be a dull lawyer ultimately it's the charity trustees that carry the can and there is collective responsibility when it comes to that um, so we have to when we are including um, we have to make sure that that support is there and that comes through charity trustee training um, whether it's annually, whether it, you know, there, there is so much training out there that does not cost. Um, but I don't know what perhaps Gillian's experience is. We are regularly cancelling charity trustee training because people aren't wanting to come along. Now, it might be lunchtime, it might be at the end of the day. We're offering a free glass of wine, a free bacon roll first thing in the morning. But I, th I think that is so important because it's about decision making. The most important thing and the, the most challenging thing we do as charity trustees is take those decisions. And we have to be well informed and include the lived experience so that we, are as, we can be as best we can be. But that has to sit underneath the umbrella of discharging your legal obligations. So it's, it's a very tough balancing act for me, I just think we have to do so much more when it comes to training. 
Thank you, Kenneth. I think the, the kind of message I'm getting, particularly from Megan and Fiona with a PE, is that, um, that kind of you don't have to choose between lived experience and professional or other experience. You can actually have of all of that in one person. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that, again, that's something about some of the assumptions that, that we make. So <clears throat> we've just got just under five minutes to go. So what I'm going to do is, yeah, I'm, I'm going to come to each person, starting with Megan, and then along the line and say, very quick thought from what you've heard um, and one thing you would change about charity governance. Cool. Um, yeah, I think... And what you said, Gillian, about like, I wouldn't want a leg up, like, because I'm okay. I think when we use kind of terminology like that, that is like, it's, um, we should start with someone else, Anna. Sorry. Um, but basically, it's like that, that person has a kind of personal deficit and they need a leg up to achieve what other people are already achieving. Mm -hmm. That's not right. There is systemic oppression and bias against various groups, whether that is because you're young or you're black or because of your background, whether you've been involved in the criminal justice system or homelessness or addiction or whatever it is, there is um, additional barriers that you have to overcome that maybe someone from your background wouldn't. And it's about removing those barriers. And if that is about additional training um, or like flexible working or whatever that is, um, coaching to remove those barriers for people, then that is what we need to do. Um, and that shouldn't actually be best practice because, like you said, like the opposite of being racist is being anti-racist. If you're not actively dismantling those barriers, then you're a part of the problem. It shouldn't be a nice thing to do. It should be what we strive for. Um, yeah. Thank you. Fiona. Can I just add to what you've said there? That deficit model is so wrong because consistently we think that people are not joining or are not part of the system because somehow or other they are deficit and we need to fix them and get them to where everybody else is. And I think that's really important, particularly when we're talking about governance. So there's a danger in doing that. But what we are talking about is not that. When you have people that you have deliberately chained and put in shackles for years, you don't bring them to the, to, to the, to the to the line with everybody and say, now you run. You are now free to run. Because, and then believe that you've completely been fair. So what we're saying is, bring them to the line, but more importantly, can you look at what the line is? Can you look at what is happening that is causing that? So it's really important that we understand, don't try to train and fix people. I'm interested in, I would be interested to take the conversation away on why you know, boards are not going for training. Because if it is the people that are already, they, they have the time often, or they, maybe they don't have the time, I don't know. But if we're saying a high percentage is white male um, privileged people, why are they not then able to go for <coughs> training? Is it because, I don't know, I don't want to make assumptions, but you would think that if we need support, if we need trained, we're gonna go for training. Why are we not going for training? So the one thing that I would say, get yourselves, get ourselves trained. And especially if we're talking about working with communities that have been minoritized, you know, and othered, we need to, and we need to be trained on how to not other, how to not minoritize how to change that, because the, in the end, charities are working towards changing that. And if we're changing that, do we need to be taught and educated on how to do that? Thank you, Fiona. So Fiona with an F. <laughs> Great, well, well said. I, I, I think Megan and Fiona I would you know, have articulated that issue, I think, so powerfully, and it's something I think for all of us to go and think about, and I'd be very happy having a conversation as well in terms of what's getting in the way what would great look like? I think that's really important. Maybe to come from a, a related but slightly separate angle, I think one common word that I think is sticking in my head hearing all the conversations is our ability to listen. Um, and, you know, if I think of the SSPC, I know and I can't take credit for it. Kirsten and the team did it before I came in. They literally spoke to thousands of people as we developed the 10-year strategy. So it comes to Fiona's point, going out into communities, surveying people, 
talking to them, talking to people who'd struggled with animals, talking to our partners. All of us have amazing partners, and as a donor, there's nothing annoys me more than charities with big egos that don't play nice together. When I give money, I want to know people are cooperating so we can learn from our partners, we can learn from those we're supporting. Um, so I would, that's my big takeaway from this, is have we got the ability to listen and are we really doing it? Or are we just listening to ourselves in the small group that we happen to have around the board table? Thank you. Kenneth. I think I said what I think we need to change. I think we need to improve um, the, the induction and training for us all. And I think we will all benefit. I mean, I've benefited greatly from the conversation this morning um, and hearing the, you know, what everybody's had to say. Um, but look at the room. <coughs> Look at how many people are in this big room. Not a lot. Mm -hmm. Didn't control the room we were in, unfortunately. We're in the Beyonce <laughs> stadium, but we're actually a wee folk band. Anyway. If only they'd known how marvellous we were, they'd all have come. <laughs> <laughs> Gillian. Um, I think what I'm reflecting on is the need to be open-minded and flexible. Kenneth and I have been doing this job for a really long time. And constitutions don't change much. The way things are done doesn't change much. So I think it's being really open-minded about what needs to change. But also, we have talked today about some of the negatives about how things are done. But I think also being really positive about the fact that Scotland's public sector, to a certain extent, is propped up by an army of volunteers. And whoever is going to do it, whatever your experience is, that is great and people generally speaking not always and including the horror show scenarios I was talking about a lot of times people don't end up in those situations out of badness there are all sorts of things um, mixed up on that and it's just being prepared to learn and be flexible because sorry I sound really preachy um, yeah <laughs> In there. <laughs> That's great. It wasn't preaching at all. Thank you very much. So I'd just like to, to finish up now by saying thank you very much to our panel. I think that we've heard really different but common themes coming from, from everybody. I really appreciate all your different perspectives. And thank you guys for, for coming and, uh, and for listening to the event today. I hope you've learned something from it. And we're still going to change the world, aren't we? We're definitely, we're going to make it better. We're going to get away from Victorianism and get into the 21st century. So thank you. I'll enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you.